We have responded so many times to suicidal parties. Shoot me! No, don't do it. And people with mental health disorders. Kristen, come out here. That law enforcement is synonymous with mental health now. On the streets, in the jails, across Colorado. Put the weapon down, sir! It happens every day. Suicidal subject. No! People in mental health crisis. The criminal justice system kill whoever tries to stop them. forced to step into the gap where the mental health system is failing. We're trained for public safety, trained to help people, but we're not psychiatrists. Hi, I'm John Ferrugia. Welcome to Insight. It is a problem that is pervasive in our communities across Colorado. People with a history of mental illness who are suicidal or who are suffering a temporary mental health breakdown that has turned violent. Yet state officials admit there are simply not enough mental health services to help them. Now the fact is most people dealing with mental health issues are never violent. But for thousands across our state who have become a danger to themselves or others, the criminal justice system has often become the only way for them to get treatment. In a special one-hour Insight report, we're now going to take you inside the daily patrols of police and sheriffs around the state who have to deal with mentally ill persons who are not getting the services they need. It is taking a terrible toll on both officers and those who find themselves in a mental health crisis. A suicidal subject. Should be nobody else in the house. It was a police radio call that happens routinely across the state of Colorado. A suicidal subject wife was advised to leave the home. The wife of 40-year-old Randall Roddick called the Douglas County Sheriff reporting that her husband was loading his guns and talking about dying. Male has a loaded 9mm with him. Ten people will kill whoever tries to stop him. Both his wife and relatives said Roddick had been depressed for years. He was an alcoholic and addicted to opioids and talked often about suicide. He has a gun room in the basement, multiple caliber guns. There had been previous police calls to his home and before the shooting, his wife said, he was going crazy. The RP is reporting he is willing and ready to have a shootout with us. We kind of assumed that if he was going to commit suicide, why would he be loading up all these guns and ammo? This could be a suicide by cop. One of the officers responding was Detective Dan Bright. As soon as I got into position, uh, he started firing uh, AK-47 directly towards me. Shot fired, shot fired! Because of the way the vehicles were positioned, I was the only officer that he could see. Shot fired, man down, man down, one of ours. So I knew uh, a law enforcement officer had been shot and was down. Officer Ronnie Durrell from the Parker Police Department had heard the gunshots and the radio traffic. I was probably about maybe a little under a half a mile away. Roger Adam, he's on the road, he's on Dixon. And we got information that the suspect was, was mobile. Still in his RV, uh, headed through the field, if someone could try to contain him. When the suspect went mobile, I said, hey, I'm, we're, we're gonna go. Hey, I'm taking your car. Durrell and another officer immediately ran for a nearby police car to respond to the RV on the run. My whole thought process when I was going was, we need to stop him and we cannot let him get to Parker Road. At that day and time, very, very populated, a lot of innocent lives are nearby. Roddick continued to fire as he drove the RV through a field toward a middle school, shooting at a local hospital before crashing his vehicle. What kind of car is it? It's an RV, big white RV. As I was responding, I knew what this individual had just done. I was trying to prevent him from getting access to the public. Shot fired, shot fired. There it is, bro. Shot fired. There's a pickup truck and like a smaller SUV pulled over on the side of the road. And I immediately knew that was my cover. Where's he at? Where's he at? Move, move. Front seat, front seat. I took a position, I, I raised my rifle, and I knew I had to stop the threat. I got him, he's down, he's down! 232, suspect's down, gunshot wound to the head. While the threat was over, the radio was crackling with the news no one wanted to hear. Who got hit? Is he all right? No. Dan Bright was shot. It's just a really weird feeling just knowing that um, this was the last place where 
I was healthy and, and I was able to walk and I was able to carry on my life. Um, man, that kind of puts the focus on what, what has been lost. It was a poignant moment when he returned for the first time to the place where he was shot. I think there could have been more provided to him um, to become healthy. Remarkably, Dan Bright does not blame the man who shot him. More resources, um, more education on his part and on his family's part. This view comes from his perspective as a detective who has dealt with countless calls involving the mentally ill and people in crisis. We are often the last line of defense in trying to get them the help they need. I don't think they should have to interact with law enforcement in order to get that, um, that kind of uh, health care. And that's what's happening every day. Right, right. How many times are you dealing with mentally ill people or suicidal parties just in your, your daily routine? Every day, um, multiple times a day. Is there a toll on you as an individual for having to do this? Yeah, absolutely. I've been told I'm not the same person that I was three years ago. Uh, it changes you. I've dealt with my own mental health um, as a result of the situations that I've been in. And 15 months later, it happened again. Ronnie Durrell was called as part of a SWAT team to a Highlands Ranch apartment complex where a mentally ill man, Matthew Reel, was holed up in his bedroom with high-powered weapons and ammunition. Who is there at the door? Identify yourself now. Real had been raging for hours, live streaming parts of his rant. Did not get that message? Just... And when other deputies tried taking Real in on a mental health hold... Sheriff's office! He fired on them. <laughs> wounding four officers and killing Douglas County Deputy Zach Parrish. I could tell you how many rounds he fired. But it was in the hundreds. Now, Durrell and his team were sent in to try to end the threat. Oh, they're going. They're going. I was the first one that went into that apartment with my team. And we were immediately met with gunfire from Matthew Reel. It was an all out firefight. I could feel bullets passing my face. I could taste the drywall that was in the air from all the rounds that were being shot. For the second time in his career, Ronnie Durrell fired his weapon in the line of duty. And for the second time, he killed a mentally ill man. In both the Roddick and Real cases, the local district attorney ruled Durrell had no choice but to act. We have responded so many times to suicidal parties and people with mental health disorders that Law enforcement is synonymous with mental health now. I wish there were better avenues for people um, that are dealing with mental health issues because I don't want what happened to Zach to happen to anybody else. I don't want people to have to lose their lives because their mental health disorder overtook them. Our independent analysis of police shootings in Colorado found at least 33 people shot by police since 2016 had a history of mental illness, were suicidal, or seemed to be in a mental health crisis at the time of the incident, according to investigation reports. That's at least 17% of 185 incidents. But how did law enforcement come to be the default for handling people with mental illness? It should be possible within a decade or two to reduce the number of patients in mental institutions by 50% or more. It is 1963, and President John F. Kennedy is laying out a new plan to care for people with serious mental illness. Under this legislation, custodial mental institutions will be replaced by therapeutic centers. Kennedy wanted to move people out of asylums and into community health centers, but those centers never got enough federal funding. And mark an end to the excessive growth in government bureaucracy. In 1981, President Ronald Reagan slashed federal spending on mental health. He wanted states to pick up the slack using less federal money. They were trying to save money essentially by discharging people to the streets uh, without proper services. And uh, that didn't work. 
Mark Ivendick of Disability Law Colorado says the burden of care is now falling largely on the criminal justice system. You shouldn't have to uh, call you know, the county sheriff, uh, deputies, for someone that uh, is in crisis. They should, you know, essentially be admitted to a mental health treatment facility. But they don't have the beds. But they don't have the beds. So now... We have to open up institutions. We can't let these people be on the streets. But that takes money, money most states simply don't have. Colorado has only two state-run mental hospitals for inpatient care. And those hospitals had so little space in 2018, they froze all admissions except for people who have been accused of crimes. The state ended the freeze and announced plans to expand both hospitals this year. But according to a 2019 Colorado Health Institute study, nearly 14 percent of people in a random statewide survey said they needed mental health care but didn't get it. What is the largest gateway to mental health services in the state right now? I would have to say that would be the jails, county jails. One, seven, eight, two, five, eight, okay. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Well, first of all, how are you feeling? Good. Tired. Good, are you? A little stressed. Okay. I am talking with 25-year-old Forrest Williams through the video system at the Arapaho County Jail. I've had no to go suicide attempts from here. Are you feeling better now, though, and that you're not wanting to harm yourself? Correct, yes. Yeah. After going to the DR and getting stapled, I enjoyed sure feel better. Williams is here after being arrested in February 2019 for injuring his mother, Judith Wilson. I had a, a cut on my cheek and over here from just pressure from the butter knife. What was the feeling inside you at that time when you when you get into these uh, episodes? Depression to the point of burning rage. Williams is one of tens of thousands of people statewide who have not received adequate mental health treatment. They've been placed on an M1 or mental health hold by law enforcement. They've been returned to their homes or to the street without getting the long-term help and mental health support they need. Then they just begin the cycle all over again. For the family, this is just one more episode in a long tortured journey through mental illness. He was diagnosed bipolar at age five. As a teenager, despite psychiatrists and therapy, Williams' behavior got worse. He started to have more um, meltdowns, started to become aggressive and hurting himself, doing a lot of um, cutting on his arms. Um, also started um, banging his head on the walls. And that's also when Judith Wilson began calling 911 for help and having Williams taken in on mental health holds. And in the last four years, the calls have gotten more frequent. I've, I've actually lost count because I couldn't get him to into the doctor. Or if I did have an appointment, there are times I couldn't get him there and I couldn't safely drive him there because he was um, psychotic. And that simply continued a cycle that has been going on for years. So then he'd go on the M1 hold, but then they'd only keep him for a little bit or switch up his meds, send him home, and then it would, it would escalate again. She says there were times Williams was so sick that short-term inpatient care was needed, but beds are scarce. And then they um, call around to the different inpatient uh, facilities pretty much in the entire state. There's times that he's been in Fort Collins, there's times he's been put in Colorado Springs, there's other times he's just been down the street. It's just whoever has a bed available. Was he better after those three days? He wasn't agitated or in severe psychosis, but he wasn't stable. He wasn't functional and not where he needed to be. And each time there would be an appointment with a psychiatrist set up for two to three weeks out for follow-up, but... He wouldn't even make it to the appointment because I would have to call to have him put an M1 hold again because he would become so psychotic and so just delusional that he needed to be inpatient again. It's an address that I've been to numerous times. Because of someone who isn't getting mental health treatment that they that they need. And how's everyone else? We're hanging in. Yeah. Yeah. A little different without him being here. It's odd. Yeah. Very quiet. There would be times where he would, we would just need to come because he was just out of control and, and, and the mom didn't know what to do. 
uh, and there'd be times where forests would be elevated to the point where we'd have to use physical force to restrain him. Arapahoe County Deputy Sheriff Chris Donovan is crisis intervention trained, or CIT. The volume continues to rise for these kind of calls. He has learned how to recognize and engage those who are mentally ill or in crisis to try to keep them, the community, and himself safe. It's just another tool on your belt to be able to de-escalate situations and, and understand to a degree where these people are at in the current moment in time. And if you don't have that kind of training, you're not going to know what to look for, what, what are triggers, what are some hooks that you can try and throw out there that then you build a, rep, a rapport with that person. Now they went from up here to down here, and now you can actually have a conversation with them. It is training that sheriff and police departments across the state and around the country are finding essential as the number of 911 mental health calls is exploding. Please don't leave me. The idea is to put officers through a realistic situation where a person is demonstrating symptoms of depression or psychosis that could lead them to harm themselves or others. I'm here to help you. You might have a lot of horrible things you might have to face, but I, I'm here to help you through it and I'm going to make sure that we get to tomorrow. It teaches us methods and ways to talk to these people that most individuals don't have the training for. For Chris Donovan, dealing with people with mental illness has become a large part of every shift on the street. And he may see many of the same people every week because he says proper mental health services simply aren't available. We see a lot of people that we take are out four hours later, a day later, and we're, we're right back in the same spot that we started. Is this fair to the mentally ill? Would it be fair for you know someone with cancer to not get the proper treatment? No, people would be up in arms. So I don't think it's fair for these mentally ill people that there's not enough resources, there's not enough facilities for them to go and get the proper treatment. I feel terrible saying this, but I am. I'm relieved that he's somewhere being watched and I don't have to do that anymore. It's frustrating that ultimately he had to commit a crime to get help that he needs. Take care of yourself, okay? For sure. Okay. Bye. 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 We get a call basically of a man with a weapon. You're white male, approximately 30 years old, wearing a black hoodie and a military style hat. They give me a description. Where was he last seen? Sitting on the curb just prior to the parking garage and they think he has a handgun on him. As Officer Richard Jones of the Pueblo Police Department walks up. Hey, put your hands up. He sees the man turn toward him with gun in hand. Put the weapon down, don't move. Jones has his own gun out and ready. Put the weapon down, put the weapon down. He's not looking at anybody, not doing anything, not saying anything, and he's got a thousand yard stare. Put the weapon down, sir. As Jones continues to yell, the gunman walks toward him and Jones sees he's wearing a sweatshirt indicating he's a veteran. Come on, man, one bet to another. Jones is not only a CIT officer, he trains others in crisis intervention. And this is how it works in the field. Dude, don't do it to another vet. Don't do it to me. Jones immediately uses his training to try to find a hook, some way to connect. Dude, I'm a retired army guy. Let me help you. Don't make me do this. The armed veteran in a mental health crisis says he can get no help. Then let me help you, but not this way. No help. Let me help you. As Jones pleads with the man, other officers arrive at the scene, weapons drawn. The vet is holding the loaded semi-automatic handgun stiffly at his side, and Corporal Richard Jones is hoping he does not raise it toward the officers. Please drop it, brother. We've lost too many already. I know you're hurting, man. I was too, but I went about four months ago. So let me help you, please. Despite the pleading, the man keeps asking Jones to shoot him. Shoot me. I can't do that, man. I can't do that. Suddenly, as Jones tries to move the conversation to appeal to the man's religious faith, the man puts his hands together on the gun as if he's going to raise it to fire. You believe in Jesus Christ, brother? Don't do it. Don't do it. Then shoot me. No, don't, don't do it. I was in your shoes a few months ago, brother. It took everything in my body. Man, I'm six foot five, 300 pound paratrooper. Took everything in my world to call VA and to finally get the help. And I got the help, but I want to help you, man, because I'm tired of losing brothers and sisters. But I can't help you if you don't help me, okay? The Lord sent me here to you today. He didn't send one of these other guys. He sent me as a vet to you to help you.
because I'm there. I've been there. After nearly 11 minutes of having his gun leveled at the man, pleading with him, the tense standoff finally ends. Just, just drop it. Just drop it. Okay, put your hands on your head for me. At that moment, Richard Jones knew he had succeeded in saving the life of a veteran just like him, who was in a mental health crisis. The relief was overwhelming. <laughs> After gathering himself best as he could, he went to the fellow vet and hugged him. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to get you some help. We're going to start right now. I'm going to get you over here to Parkview and we're going to get it taken care of, okay? Love you, bro. Good job, man. Were you prepared at any point to shoot him? I, I was. I was prepared from the minute I left my vehicle and I approached that vehicle and he stood up with that gun. I will tell you that I'm thankful I was there that day and I'm thankful I've had the experiences that I've had that brought me there that day. Because when I think about some of my younger officers, I don't know if, they, if we would have had the same outcome. We deal with a lot of these cases and we get a lot that have weapons with them. There's days that we're one after the other after the other. I mean, uh, this is normal. This is normal. People just don't understand. And Joan says having daily responsibility to deal with the mentally ill in crisis keeps officers from other important calls. It is part of our job, but I can't do a burglary in progress because I'm doing, uh, I'm doing one mental patient or party having a bad day after another. And Jones, like so many other officers, is frustrated that his efforts seem to make very little difference. There's been numerous times that I've been finished. I've left this patient with, with the mental health counselor, left, gone to the station, finished my paperwork, come back out, and the patient's walking down the street in front of me. No place to put him. No. This is ridiculous, you know. The normal person doesn't know. You know, politicians don't have a clue. They do not have a clue about it. There's no guarantee in our current safety net system that the individuals will get served with the level of services they need. Robert Worthwine is the director of Colorado's Office of Behavioral Health, tasked with overseeing the state's mental health system. It's over the over-reliance on the criminal justice system, the law enforcement system. I'd like a model that, that doesn't require the law enforcement system to be uh, an integral part of it, right? So that the, the, the people in the community can get services without needing law enforcement. But Worthwine knows that's nowhere on the current horizon. And that means police and sheriffs are on the streets, sometimes in dangerous situations, dealing with people who are in a mental health crisis. What do you say to those officers who are on the street just terribly frustrated that their day is taken up basically with mentally ill people. I say, so we agree, and that's why we are in the, uh, investing. We're not there yet completely. We are investing in these systems. They're just really young. And for now, many of those still involve law enforcement. One thing one arrival. Like the EDGE co-responder program in Boulder County, where a mental health professional accompanies the police or sheriff on a crisis call. Hey. There are similar programs in several parts of the state, but in most cases, they're not 24-7. And Worthwine says the only way to break the cycle of jailing people with mental illness is to provide more and varied levels of services across the state. There are a lot of people who need inpatient level of care, but there are a lot of people who need community-based intense care so that the individuals can stay at home and they can live in their community and get intensive services. Sometimes it requires having a social worker drop in daily saying, did you take your meds today? Do you have bus tokens to get to where you need to get to? Um, sometimes it takes that much. And, and those intense services simply don't exist in most of Colorado. Yeah, they're extremely limited in most of Colorado. And then there's the issue of insurance and how individuals can actually access such care or even inpatient care. When we're talking about insurance payment, whether it be Medicaid paying or your, your uh, private insurance paying, there's a limited number of providers. And he says that often means waiting lists for treatment. And many who need mental health services simply can't wait. For them and their families, there's often only one alternative. Uh, law enforcement's a guarantee. They have an obligation to uh, interact when they, they don't get the choice of saying no. Right. Um, but the, the provider world can say no. I would spend hours Googling on how to get help, where I could go, and I just couldn't find anything. They'd start, you know, talking about insurance. I'm like, well, I don't have that. So what am I going to do? I have the pad thai, no spice. So I have two jobs. It's 2713. I'm a waitress at one job. Good, I'm glad. And I'm a machine operator at another. Oh, thank you. I'm very proud of myself for being able to be a waitress because I'm dealing with the public. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you.
I kind of can prove to myself that <laughs> I can interact with people in ways that I couldn't before. Exactly. Kristen Lipsky, like many 30-somethings, is working and planning to return to school to finish her degree. So I'll be right back. <laughs> but unlike most of her peers, she is also working to overcome a history of mental illness. When I was 14, I did get admitted to a mental health hospital and I was diagnosed with depression. And I think that there's a stigma with mental health that I didn't want to admit that I was depressed. What it was, why I was drinking and smoking weed, I don't know. And a year later, things only got worse. It was in the drug rehab that the counselor uh, sexually assaulted me. And I just remember taking scolding hot showers, hating myself. Finally, I don't know why I got the courage, but I was like, I can't do this anymore. So I reported it to staff. And he was prosecuted? He was prosecuted. After that happened, um, I would say I went on a downward spiral. I started using drugs I'd never used before, but I fell right back, fell right back down into the hole. And she stayed in that hole for years in a cycle of mental illness and self-medication. And when I came across meth and it made the pain stop, people would always ask me, why do you do this? And I said, because it makes my heart stop hurting. And that only sent her deeper into isolation and paranoia. I would be on a bus. You ring, ring a bell to let the driver know that's your next exit. And when I ring the bell, I look around to see if anyone's gonna be following me. And I would see a guy get up and I feel like he would be following me. So I would get scared. I'd start having a panic attack. I would think that he's after me. Um, and then I would not get off. I stay on the bus for the full route again until I hit that stop again to make sure that he's not following me. Dispatch I'm making announcements. It was a day she was coming down from a high. Sheriff's office! A day she threatened her mother with a knife. You're in the house, make yourself known! A day the deputies were called. Show me your hands. Come out here. Kristen, come out here. It is clear that both Kristen, whose paranoia was peaking, and the deputies, armed with a taser and a gun, were unsure what was going to happen. I thought that they were going to rape me. And I didn't believe that they were real police. Nothing will happen if you walk to the red dot. I think I kept asking them, are you police, are you the military? Are you a military? I'm Weld County Sheriff's Office. The deputies had no idea whether Kristen was armed. Get your hand out of your pocket. Turn around. They just knew she was incoherent and saw the shotgun over the fireplace. And Kristen was moving closer to it. You're going to rape me, aren't you? No, ma'am. Nope. Finally, they tased her. She stabbed one officer with a knife she had in her pocket, but they finally subdued her without serious injury. You got any other weapons on you, Kristen? No. Walk on out here with me, okay? Even when they detained me, I was waiting for them to pull my pants off. And I was screaming, no, 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 because I was waiting for it to happen. I just had a knife. That I used on you. Because everybody rapes Where's me. I'm lucky that I was not shot and killed by the police. And you understand that? Oh yeah. I had, I had an angel looking out for me. Are you guys gonna save me? We're gonna do all we can for you, okay? Once in custody, Kristen was taken to jail and was given mental health treatment and medication to stabilize her. She then spent three months in jail before she was allowed to bond out and begin daily treatment prior to trial. She pled guilty to a felony in the incident and was sentenced to eight years in custody in a halfway house. Now she's getting the mental health treatment she needs. So I've been going to therapy for two years, getting state, state funding for it. I don't have to worry about the financials. I can worry about getting my head on straight and working and doing, functioning as a normal person in society. Like many who are aware of their mental illness, Kristen says before her arrest, she knew she needed inpatient help but she had no money or private insurance. So she signed up for state-funded Medicaid benefits, but she says she could find no one who would take it. Because it was months before the incident that I was searching for the help. And I feel like if I could have gotten that help then, 
would I have put everybody through the pain that I put them through or, you know, I cost the courts money, I cost the jails money, I cost the community a lot of money by being arrested. And in fact, you're getting the care you need now and it's paid by, for by the state anyway. That's correct. That's one thing that the director at the halfway house has, has said is we have state funding for you. If you feel you're struggling in any way, let us know so we can get you the help that you need. But the only way that you can have someone telling you this is if you're convicted of a crime and serving a sentence in the halfway house. While Kristen Lipsky is proud of her progress, she still thinks about the day she almost died. Have you ever talked to the officers again? I wrote them a letter at my sentencing. Um, I was able to read it to him. I thanked him for saving my life that day, that it took the, something like that happening to get the help I needed. And I also thanked him for not shooting me. I have a family member who's in law enforcement, so I know how scary it is for that person to go out on the field every day wondering if they're gonna come home alive. I feel a lot of shame and guilt for putting him and his family through it what I did. It's really sad. Even so, she's trying to look forward and not look back. I was functioning at some point in my life and I started school and I dropped out. Now I'm at the point where I want to restart school. I want to graduate with my degree. I can give back to my community and I want to be able to give back, especially with how I feel I've taken in a way. All right, thank you. Um, I want to give back. Our investigation found that in 2018, Colorado police and sheriffs enforced a mental health hold more than 33,000 times where a person was determined to be a danger to themselves or to their communities. And it isn't only cops on the street who are dealing with people with mental health issues. Our investigation shows that for eight of the state's largest county jails, from 22 to almost 70% of the inmate population was receiving mental health treatment in 2018. That means that statewide, jail deputies are dealing with thousands of inmates who are struggling with their mental health. This was one of my more enjoyable assignments. I really it did like to be able to connect with the public. They'll come up and talk with you if you're on the horse. Doug Faust is proud of his career as a Douglas County Sheriff's deputy. I love that part of the job, getting out there and greeting and having people wave and such and be approachable. He recently retired after 20 years where he had worked on the street, on the county's mounted patrol, and in the county jail dealing with inmates. <laughs> Some of whom could be unruly. I was um, a member of the crisis uh, uh, intervention unit. CIT. CIT. It was a large part of what I did dealing with the individual's mental health issues. Faust prided himself in using his special training to keep inmates calm and guiding them toward self-control. So I would go in and I would check the files and see how people were um, dealing with their day and how to react with them. Deputy Faust thought he was particularly helpful to Ronald Bra, who had been sent to the state mental hospital in Pueblo where his medications were adjusted before returning to jail. He was like the, the gentle giant, really. He was huge. They told me, well, he's uh, 6'7", 285, and I felt like we had a connection that I could get through to him and that I could work with him. But that changed one day when Deputy Faust was working alone in this special management unit and had instructed inmates to clean their cells. I brought over the cleaning supplies and such and said, hey, Mr. Bra, I thought maybe you might want to take some extra time and uh, clean up your cell. And he said, no, no. And that's uh, where he was, just went off. I don't know if it was a right cross, but something hit me. He uh, was on top of me, beating on my face and body, and I was trying to protect my face with my hands. and. Um, uh, trying to key my radio for assistance. As the violent struggle continued, Ronald Bra used the cord on Faust's radio to strangle him. I was turning blue as my as dark uh, blue as my uniform pants at that time, and the uh, the nurse afterwards said, "You had seconds to live." By keying his mic, Faust had gotten the attention of a deputy in the video command center who saw what was happening and sounded the alarm. I remember hearing the steel door opening 
and then all these uh, black boots and blue pants, pant legs running my way. Doug Faust was taken to the hospital with injuries to his face and a fully torn shoulder rotator cuff. Even after a year of recovery and rehab on light duty, he still could no longer meet the physical requirements to be a deputy. So I guess that's the end of the career. Come on in, I'll see what I can find out. So he reluctantly accepted a job as a staff member working the front desk. Even so, he never wanted to see Ronald Bra prosecuted. He needs mental health help. He just doesn't need to be incarcerated for that. But the terror of the attack by the mentally ill inmate lingered for years. He would wake in the middle of the night thrashing, his wife trying to defend herself. She starts yelling, don't beat me up, I'm your wife, because I was still fighting the battle. So, so you'd have these nightmares? Uh, I, had, I had to deal with that for some time. At the Boulder County Jail, incarceration means immediate mental health evaluation. And it begins here at the booking desk. And they'll be asked a series of questions dealing with both their medical health and their mental health. Boulder County Sheriff Joe Pelly, who has been a longtime proponent of providing mental health treatment in jails, says to protect the public, he had no choice but to implement a full service mental health program. You have to decide um, what your philosophy is going to be. And if it's warehousing and security, uh, this problem is never going to get solved. The Boulder County program is data driven, and that is in part why the county supports and funds it. When I became sheriff, 13% of the inmates in our jail had an AXIS-1 mental health diagnosis. They'd been diagnosed with the, you know, bipolar issue or um, schizophrenia. Pelly says that 13% from when he was first elected in 2002 has now on some days grown to 60% of the jail population receiving mental health services. We'll see everything from just a unique situational depression all the way up to the most severe where somebody is, is actively psychotic or has um, suicidal attempts. Melanie Drayling, a registered nurse and the jail's health service administrator, says the jail has a two-pronged approach to treatment. So what I supervise is more of your acute care. So that's going to be getting people on medications and working to get them stabilized. Um, the other side of the house is the program side of the house, and that's for people that are going to be with us a while. A lot of our clients that come in here, this is the first time they'll get treatment. This is the first time they might even get diagnosed. Commander Tim Oliveira heads jail programs and support services. Once somebody is stabilized from an acute illness, if you will, mental health wise, they can progress through the jail. And if they require psychotropic medication, we can prescribe them that. Well, you have one-on-one. -on -one. They also have psychoeducational groups. They also have therapeutic group opportunities. So they will engage in these group-led uh, sessions by a licensed therapist. The longer they're with us, the better they thrive. We really see people go from being actively psychotic to being a healthy, normal, stable person when they leave our jail. A lot of people would say, you know, you're, you're not in the jail business anymore, you're in the <laughs> mental health business. Yes, jails are becoming these mental health institutions because people don't have anywhere else to go. Uh, my name is Matthew Williams. He has been diagnosed with bipolar disorder and PTSD. In the past, he has used illegal drugs to treat his condition, and he has a criminal record and was picked up in Boulder on a felony warrant. I started with gun in Oklahoma. I had some PTSD already um, in my life. I felt like that was the thing to keep me safe, was to get a weapon. He says it was the death of his son that sent him into a mental health spiral. I held him. Um, whenever he was born, they tried to resuscitate him, and they couldn't get him back. Uh, that messed me up a lot. Critics argue that jail should be punitive, not a place to provide full-service mental health care. But for detainees like Williams, who for the first time has received treatment and counseling here, it is life-changing. I wasn't focusing on anything that I set out to do. And they put me on some medication, and it's really helped out a lot. And that's to treat your bipolar <clears throat> disorder? Bipolar disorder and my nightmares yeah. and my trouble sleeping, which kind of all goes together. He now draws, has taken other classes, and will complete his high school GED. I had a, a lot of built up stuff that I did not know existed. I have never seen nothing like this program and it was a blessing to be in here. Since we first talked with him, Williams has moved on to serve his state prison sentence and he has continued to focus on his mental health. He's told us he's doing well. But just as important and essential in the Boulder model is the PACE, our Partnership for Active Community Engagement program, 
for those who don't go to prison but are allowed back into the community on probation. We've put the probation officer, mental health provider, community health, public health provider, uh, and a case manager all under one roof so that they're not just leaving our jail without access to medication or without access to support. The goal of the program is to coordinate with prosecutors, judges, and the parole system to stop recycling the same people through the criminal justice system without any hope of success. A couple years ago, I was, I was a mess. I was into drugs, I have a mental illness. Joe Dankowski has bipolar disorder and suffers from schizophrenia. If you hadn't gone through the Boulder County Jail and gotten these services, where do you think you'd be now? Dead. You'd be dead. I'd be dead. You really think it's life and death? Yeah. I really do. We have a support network that helps people re-engage and then be productive citizens versus get released and have no support network and continue to revolve back in there. Matt Jekyll is manager of the Boulder County PACE program. It serves more than 100 people annually. We provide people structure. Our entire team knows who you are. You see them daily. We build relationships. But you also have a, the probation element that's here to around accountability for attendance, participation. Joe Dankowski says he was out of control. He kept cycling in and out of jail, but not anymore. He says he now understands his illness and his treatment. I know what I need to do to have a clear mind to get back on track. Do you still hear the voices? They're very quiet. And you know what they are? Yes. Do they scare you? Not no more. It's remarkable. Um, he's, uh, he's the same personality, absolutely. And he's a person who believes in himself Jekyll acknowledges the upfront costs are expensive, but he contends treatment for patients like Dankowski versus jail is a bargain for taxpayers. It costs more to put a person in jail and keep them there per day than it does to utilize our services. But in jail mental health treatment and programs like PACE are not possible for cash strapped small or rural counties. While Sheriff Joe Pelly understands that, he says he can document why Boulder could be a statewide model because Boulder County tracks a target group of former inmates who were continually in and out of jail, but who have now gone through the PACE program. We've had a savings of about 10,000 jail bed days a year with a group of 50 or 60 people participating in that program. 10,000 jail bed days a year at $163 a day per, j per jail bed. That's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. So this stuff can be impactful. Um, it's expensive to implement, yet it's pennies on the dollar compared to incarcerating someone. And he started hitting his head on the side of the, the cell wall there on the concrete cinder blocks. And kept hollering that he just wanted to kill himself. He wanted to die. Right now, he's huddled up in a corner with the blanket on top of him, away from everybody. In Del Norte, Colorado, rural Rio Grande County, Under Sheriff Ed Rapp says this is how his department tries to keep a mentally ill person safe. He uh, assaulted a family member and possibly had stole the gun. The man was tracked down without incident and deputies knew he was in crisis. We ended up taking him up to Denver. They had an M1 uh, hold? On an M1 hold for 72 hours. The undersheriff never really knows where there might be an open bed for such mental health services. Occasionally, it could be at the state mental hospital in Pueblo, but more often, it's a private state contracted provider in Colorado Springs or Denver. In this case, the provider called to tell him. That they're gonna keep him for a few more days because he just tried to hang himself. Several days later, the man was finally brought back to the county jail. And then right away, he's threatened to commit suicide, and we caught him trying to hang himself again. Then we give him what we call a suicide blanket. Uh, we give him that blanket, um, got him calmed back down, and he'll be that way until we can figure out what else to do with him. Our facility is, is not set up for mental health. How many times has this person been in your jail for mental health issues? 
I don't know. A lot? A lot. He's a frequent flyer. Is he the only one? No. No, we have several. The Rio Grande County Jail has just two holding cells where prisoners can be restrained, but they have no padding, no helmets to protect out of control mentally ill inmates, and not enough time, money, or personnel to help them. There's no hospital, there's no emergency room? No, none. We have to take them and transport them all the way to Denver. And that's on your dime? That's on our dime, and generally, whenever a person is mentally, you know, has a mental health hold on them, we're going to have to have two officers do the transport. When that happens, we're either short back in our jail or we're short on the road. The undersheriff argues that each geographic region of the state needs some type of treatment center where the mentally ill and people in crisis can get help, and he knows the major impediment is money. It would save us from having to drive five and a half hours one way just to drop off a, you know, a mental health issue. You know, even if it was as far as Alamosa, 30 miles away, at least it's doable. As it stands now, the man being held here must be evaluated to decide if he's competent to stand trial. If he's not, he must then receive treatment, but only if there's a mental health bed for him. If not, we have to wait until it comes available again. And that means he could be right back here waiting for treatment in Denver, Pueblo, or elsewhere. It doesn't matter whether you're San Luis Valley or if you're out on the Eastern Plains. The small rural counties, we don't have the facility, we don't have the money, we don't have the expertise to turn around and to deal with mental issues like this. We're trained for public safety, trained to help people, to protect people, but we're not psychiatrists. And Rapp says he's not the only one that should be upset because the system is simply not fair to people with mental illness. He should be seeing a psychiatrist daily. He should be on probably some medication to keep him leveled out to where he don't want to hurt himself or hurt somebody else. But it don't happen down in rural areas. And you're stuck with it. And we're stuck with it. We have a safety net system, um, safety net being the behavioral health system that, that guarantees services, right? That doesn't guarantee services, uh, and that's a, that's a problem. The state's failing these people. We can do more. Robert Worthwine is the director of the Colorado Office of Behavioral Health. For almost a decade, the state has consistently failed to provide timely evaluations and mental health treatment to pretrial detainees, detainees who are thought to be mentally ill. They'll be evaluated whether they uh, are incompetent to proceed with trial. For years, these mental health services could only be provided at the Colorado Mental Health Institute in Pueblo, and the space there and the staff are limited. Through lack of funding from the state, uh, the competency system uh, really never developed and kept pace with the number of new referrals coming in. Mark Ivendick is the managing attorney at Disability Law Colorado, which serves as the state's designated protection and advocacy system for the mentally ill. Individuals would uh, languish in jails without mental health treatment or competency services uh, for months on end. The backlog for competency services was so bad that in 2011, Disability Law Colorado, then known as the Center for Legal Advocacy, sued the State Department of Human Services and the State Psychiatric Hospital in Pueblo for violating detainees' constitutionally guaranteed due process rights. In 2012, a federal court ordered the state to decrease wait times and the backlog for competency services, but the state failed. So, in April 2019, the court ordered Colorado to meet strict timetables for both evaluating inmates and restoring their competency, or pay stiff financial penalties. For Worthwine, this ongoing violation of detainees' civil rights is Exhibit A in Colorado's broken mental health system, and it's costing taxpayers big money. You're talking about more than a million dollars a month that you are paying in fines. Correct. 1.3? Yeah, with a cap of 10 million for over 12 months. Records obtained from the Colorado Department of Human Services show that referrals for both competency evaluations and restorations rose sharply in 2013, and the trend continues despite the court order. That means we need more beds, um, and if we don't have those beds, those folks are waiting uh, in jail to get for a bed. And to taxpayers, that means millions more in fines. 
But Worthwine says it isn't just about the money, it's about families, and it's personal. It's about what it symbolizes, that, that somebody is waiting. Uh, and it's, it's, it's heartbreaking, I mean, there's no other way to put it. Uh, I'm a dad of an adult son who has special needs, who I worry about law enforcement needing to intervene, and we've called law enforcement. Uh, it'd break my heart if he was waiting in jail. In response to hundreds of Coloradans waiting in jails, the State Department of Human Services is adding 24 beds at the state mental hospital in Pueblo, supplementing the 70 beds that came online in 2019. And the state will, for the first time in decades, provide competency services at the state hospital at Fort Logan, funding 44 beds. But those are still years away. Also, a portion of the millions in monthly fines the state is paying is being used to house nonviolent, low level offenders in a converted hotel in Denver, where they will get mental health treatment. In the meantime, the state has partnered with two local jails in Boulder and Arapahoe counties to provide on site competency restoration, taking the pressure off the state mental hospital in Pueblo. It's called the RISE program. This is one of our patient rooms. Um, this is a room with two individuals. Ashley Gunterman is director of jail-based competency evaluation and restoration for the Office of Behavioral Health. The optics are that it is still a jail. However, the measures that we've taken to change them are safety-based. Led by the State Office of Behavioral Health and operated by a private clinical provider, the RISE, or Restoring Individuals Safely and Effectively program, is in this converted wing of the Boulder Jail. It aims to shrink the detainee backlog and get them treatment much faster. This unit itself has an additional 18 patient beds. And our other location at Arapahoe County Detention Facility has 94 patient beds. And so we're able to serve a larger amount of individuals sooner. But Gunterman says RISE is not the long-term answer and there are no plans to expand it. These programs are unique. They require a lot of unique um, programmatic factors to be considered, who we have deputy-wise, who we have clinician-wise, how we provide those services, and most importantly, who could safely succeed in this environment while receiving these services. And that is not everybody. We're looking at other options, particularly building the outpatient part. We are focused on what we're legally being told by federal court to focus on, but the problem is much bigger. It's a systemic problem in the state of Colorado. And it is the federal lawsuit and court order that are now forcing the state to review Colorado's entire mental health system. Does the safety net actually exist in the state anymore, in, in a real sense? Uh, the safety net that guarantees that you'll get services? Uh, no, there are no guarantees in Colorado if you don't have insurance. That was the circumstance Kristen Lipsky was in when she was arrested. She is one of so many in Colorado who simply cannot afford the mental health services they need. I'll put it this way, there are a lot of people who, who, who have no guarantee for services, so they are ending up in jail. And that's exactly what happened to Forrest Williams. Despite his mother's efforts, he could not get timely or consistent mental health treatment, even though he had private insurance. We want a stronger behavioral health system in Colorado, and we're working towards a strong behavioral health system in Colorado. Is it impactful enough and large enough and to the scale enough that it's um, keeping uh, enough folks out of jail? Probably not. But ultimately it's about being accountable and not just the state but all of us being accountable that are in the behavioral health system that we are delivering on what we said we will deliver on. The failure to deliver adequate access to mental health care in Colorado has prompted Governor Jared Polis to form a behavioral health task force to evaluate the shortcomings of the state's mental health system and to develop a plan to address them. You know, we've seen lots and lots of task forces over the years yeah. on, on behavioral health, on mental health. What makes this different? I'm committed to make sure that, that we're talking about real changes for, for people. He says that begins with finding out exactly how taxpayer money is being spent. Now, I know that, that the $1.4 billion in federal and state funding for behavioral health is not fixing the problem. Um, so uh, we've really got to take a serious look at that $1.4 billion and ask those two questions about whether we're spending it the right way and whether it's enough. The goal is not only to complete the analysis, but to figure out how to deliver services to those who need it, including children, and to eliminate the backlog of those awaiting mental competency restoration. All that and to begin implementation of statewide changes this year. It's a tall order, and it is unclear how this can be done with many basic questions still unanswered, like staffing. We need a bigger workforce. That's, that's one of the areas that the Behavioral Task Force is looking at. Even if they built it, or they, or having the people in the communities able to provide the care they're asking is challenging. But the toll for not overhauling the system is even higher. I think the price is, is far beyond um, just me sitting in a wheelchair or the fact that you know, the, the suspect is dead. His family and friends are affected. My family and friends are affected. So 
it, um, the price is much bigger than just what you see on a piece of paper. Access to care, I think, is a, a huge um, hurdle that we need to jump and make it more known for, for those that need it and make it more accessible for those that need it. You know, we're basically playing, in a sense, uh, a mental health counselor. And we only have a certain amount of training that allows us to do what we do. I have certain people that I go to all the time, and I am on a constant first name basis with them. And we're doing the things we can that we think we can help them with because the money's not there. I was just constantly being told no, because I would call up the uh, where he was at inpatient and say, look, this is like, you know, third or fourth time or whatever number we were on and say this is keeps going and going and he needs long-term help he needs to become stable and I was being shut down I knew I needed help and when I was searching online there should have been a clear path immediately for me to get the help I needed it was always like a catch-22 it's like I need insurance but I'm so unstable I can't hold a job to have the insurance if something doesn't get done or fixed or a solution or an idea that can be put in play, we're gonna to continue to deal with this. And now, not only is my life, my partner's life, a neighbor's life, a citizen's life in danger because there's nowhere for them to get treatment.